All right, so yes, we are busy. You've got the project due by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. You can just email it to me, it's fine. Um, and then we have our final exam again for the people that, that are online. It's different than initially what I said was going to be for the online people next Wednesday, but I gave you different options. Um, yesterday, because I found out from the administration that I was not, not allowed to give final exams on study day, at least not they, group final exams, maybe if an individual person or two wants to take it on study day, they are allowed to, I think. So um, please get back to me about times that you want to take the final exam for those who are in the online class. Based on those options that I gave you. Also tell me if none of them work. All right, I think I'd like to do three main things today. Question? Uh, for the timesheets for the um, project, do you mm -hmm. just want those like on paper or electronically? You, you either way. Friday. Yeah, you can you can personally email me your um, timesheet. Each person can, or if you did it together as a group, you can just email me one thing. Or yes, you can print it out too, and that should be turned in with your project. Thanks. Thanks for the reminder. Three things to do today. Uh, to start the process of review, reviewing for the final today and Friday. First thing I want to do that's going to take a while is I'd like to do a nonlinear bifurcation example and talk about it, similar to the one to expect on the exam. Then we'll talk more about trying to wrap up trapping regions and Poincaré Ben Dixon and what you should know about those things. And I'll also talk about some three-dimensional kinds of systems and force nonlinear systems where what's called chaotic behavior can occur and the basic kinds of things that you should know about that. And then we'll talk about Laplace transforms at the end of class today, hopefully. On Friday, we'll go back and do other stuff from chapters 1 through 4, especially. So let's start here at the bottom of this notebook. I've got a nonlinear bifurcation problem to do. And we're going to focus on doing it by hand. There it is. Your exam nonlinear bifurcation problem will be somewhat similar to this. Let's write that on the board. All right, there we go. Let's first think about drawing no planes by hand for different values of A. A is your parameter, your bifurcation parameter. Evidently, at least one bifurcation occurs in this system as A changes. So the x no plane we find, again, by setting the right-hand side of the first equation equal to 0. Is that there? You can solve that for y as a function of x. That is really loud. Solve, when you set that equal to zero, solve that for y as a function of x. That is going to be the x known plane. And for the y known plane, set the second equation, the right hand side for that, equal to zero, and solve for y as a function of x. You get that. What's going to happen with this kind of situation? Let's that's, a, that's an easy thing to draw. That's just a line through the origin with the slope of negative 1. What about this thing? How would you draw the graph of that function for different values of a? Well, it seems initially to, good to me to separate into three cases, a negative, a positive, and a equal to 0. That does not necessarily mean 0 is a bifurcation value. In fact, I know not. But just let me quick draw you three, three real rough sketches of what the graph of that function looks like for these three different cases. Let's do the A as positive one first. When A is positive, okay, first of all, this is a cubic. So the end behaviors like that. I'm going to draw real rough sketches here. You've got an 
and it's got a negative sign in front of the x cubed. So the n behavior is like this. This term here tells you what the slope is as it goes through the origin. The slope is negative a. If a is positive, that's a negative slope. You didn't get a graph, something like that. If a is 0, you're going to get a graph. That term goes away, you just get negative x cubed. You get a graph like this. And if a is negative, that makes negative a positive. You have a positive slope through the origin. You're going to get a graph like this. In the case where a is negative, so that the graph of the x null plane looks like that, if you compare it with the y null plane, you see you have at least three intersection points. Actually, exactly three intersection points. So you're going to have, for sure, three equilibrium points when a is negative. That's actually going to happen when a is zero as well. What about when a is positive? Well, it depends on what this negative slope is, is there, what negative a is. If the slope is more like this, if it's steeper, it's only going to cross the line y equals negative x once. If it's less steep, close to zero, it's going to cross it twice. Or excuse me, three times, or something like this. Okay? Probably it's not necessarily a good idea on the final exam to take the time to do what I just did. Put this in your memory bank, you're going to have a similar problem. Realize that certainly as A changes, the main thing to notice here, certainly as A changes, you're going to get a change in the number of bifurcation, number of equilibrium points, you're going to get a bifurcation. And it's probably not worth the time to take doing that on the exam. Let's focus on finding the bifurcation value of A. Where does that change in the number of equilibrium points occur? Um, Solve the system for the equilibrium points. Take this equation, y equals negative x, and go back up to this equation and replace y with negative x. Or in fact, go back to this one and replace y with negative x. And solve that equation for x. You can factor out an x. And if you're careful, what you're left with when you do that is what you see there. Check that. Multiply the x through. You get x cubed there. You get x times a. a times x right there. You get negative x right there. That tells you definitely x equals 0 will always make that 0. And if x is 0, then y is 0 as well. Definitely the origin is always an equilibrium point. These graphs are always intersection, intersecting at the origin. The origin is always an equilibrium point. What about any others? Set that part equal to zero, solve for x in terms of a. You get x squared equals one minus a, so x is plus or minus square root of one minus a. But that's only going to be a, an actual real bifurcation value, or excuse me, equilibrium point, x coordinate of an equilibrium point, when 1 minus a is greater than or equal to 0. Which is going to occur when a is less than or equal to 1. 1 is going to be your bifurcation value. At least it is a bifurcation value. There could be others. If a, is, if a is greater than 1, then this thing under the square root is negative. x would be an imaginary number. But here's an example of a situation where we don't want to think about imaginary numbers. We do want to find real equilibrium points. Imaginary eigenvalues are talked about because they're useful. But we do want real equilibrium points. So you're going to get real equilibrium points here when a is less than or equal to 1, and 1 will be a bifurcation value. The corresponding values for y using this equation will be y equals minus plus square root of 1 minus a. In other words, it's got the opposite sign as the one for x. 
because y equals negative x, and that should make sense when you look at these pictures. Those two points are on the opposite side of the origin from each other. Square root of 1 minus a and negative square root of 1 minus a. And then negative square root of 1 minus a, positive square root of 1 minus a. You've got three bifurcate three equilibrium points in the case where a is strictly less than one. When a equals one, all these three coalesce, coalesce into one, coalesce into one. When a equals one, all these are the origin. So it's three distinct equilibrium points when a is less than one. So again, at least in terms of the number of equilibrium points, you found your bifurcation value. A equals 1. Bifurcation value, at least one of them, where this change occurs. equals 1. That's a bifurcation value. There could be others if the nature of the equilibrium points changes from the sink to a source or whatever. You've got at least one bifurcation value. Let's draw the phase plane in a case where a is negative. In fact, I'm going to pick a, a particular value of a that's negative, and you're going to have to do this on the test. Let's pick a equal to negative 3. And draw the phase <coughs> plane when a equals negative 3. And I'm going to do it to the best of my ability by hand and without the benefit of the direction field, because I'm doing it by hand. And also, I'm going to try to do it without linearization, to see how well I can do without linearization. So when a is negative 3, your system becomes dx dt equals y minus 3x plus x cubed, dy dt equals x plus y, and the equilibrium points once again, 0, 0, square root of a minus 1, negative square root of a minus 1. If a is negative 3, excuse me, 1 minus a, I meant to say. If a is negative 3, then 1 minus a is 1 minus negative 3 is 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. That's nice. 2, negative 2, and negative 2, 2. going to be part of that problem to try to draw a nice phase plane for a particular value of a. I probably will give you a grid to try to draw the null planes reasonably accurately. Not necessarily perfectly, but reasonably accurately. So you've got the y null plane, y equals negative x, lying with the slope of negative 1 to the origin. That is the y null plane, therefore solutions cross it, what, vertically or horizontally? Y null plane, do they cross it vertically or horizontally? Horizontally. Horizontally, right there. The vertical component of the velocity vector is 0. By velocity vector, I mean velocity vector before the solution curve. Don't be fooled by my tick marks on the axes. Those are just tick marks. They're not. The x and y axes are not null points here. This is a y null plane. You've got to cross horizontally. The x null plane comes from there. <clears throat> and again, when a equals negative 3, this becomes, let's write it like this, negative x cubed plus 3x. 
by the way, can be factored as x times 3 minus x squared, which would tell you the roots of this cubic are 0 and plus or minus square root of 3. Square root of 3 is about 1.7. Trying to draw the x, the x and plane here reasonably accurately. It's going to cross the x-axis at three points right about there, here, and here. And it's going to be a cubic, again, with a negative <coughs> coefficient for the x cubed. So I know in between it's got to do something like this. Is it worth spending the time finding the max and the min? Probably not, although in this example it happens to be fairly simple. If you differentiated this function, you'd get negative 3x squared plus 3. That's the derivative of this function is a function of x. That's going to be 0. You're going to have critical points at plus or minus 1. And when x is 1, for example, the output is 2. And when x is negative 1, the output is negative 2. Actually, this, so this graph goes up and down kind of in a more extreme way than I was initially expecting. Something about like this. Maybe to help you draw it, maybe I'd give you some more information about like where the max and the min of the null plane might be if it's a cubic like this, and it probably will be. And the roots, just to help you draw it quickly and, and somewhat accurately. You're crossing, they're crossing each other at the points negative 2, 2 right there, and positive 2, negative 2 right about there. Those are your crossing points. And again, this is an, an x node client, so we've got to cross this vertically. Three equilibrium points, make sure you mark those, big dots. And again, let's see how well we can draw this by hand without a computer. It's good to think about the directions of the vectors in these other regions. Up here, down here, 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 and here. Six different regions to think about. Think about the signs of dx dt and dy dt in those regions. Look at this right here. Focus on dy dt first. It's positive when x plus y is positive. That's going to happen when y is bigger than negative x when you are above this line. So dy dt is positive when you are above that line. In these three regions, you're going to be above that line. And possibly dx dt has different signs in those regions. When you're below that line, then dy dt is negative. So solutions have to go downward. Now focus on the dx dt equation. Where is dx dt positive? It's positive when this is positive, which is equivalent to y being greater than negative x cubed plus 3x when you're above the cubic curve dx dt is positive. So dx dt is going to be positive here and here and here actually. Those are, the, those are three different regions where dx dt is positive so solutions have to move to the right. And dx dt is negative when you're below the cubic curve like in here, here, and else. This one, below the cubic curve, and up here. So ultimately meaning solutions in here have to go to the northeast, here they have to go to the northwest, I'm not drawing solutions yet, here they have to go to the southeast, southeast here as well, southwest, northwest. By the way these um, solutions have to travel, when you're near that point, you have to be going away from that point. That point must be a source. Same with this point. Starting at this point, you've got to go away from it. It's a source as well. What about that point? 
Well, I, I would start to draw a solution curve starting near this equal to Brune point, not on the equal Brune point, but just very close. You know you've got to head to the northwest in this region. Is it going to be a separatrix that, that approaches that point? Well, not necessarily. It could end up crossing this y line before heading now to the southwest. But if I was higher, evidently it would go up here and cross this null line like this before heading to the northeast. But there would be some solution in here. There would be a separatrix that would head to this point as t goes to infinity. Seems kind of like saddle type behavior there. And in fact, this is a saddle point. By symmetry, something similar happens up here, except on the opposite sign. You're going to have some solutions that go about like this. Other solutions that do this. You probably don't separate so much in terms of their shape, their direction there. And there's going to be one solution that heads from this point to this point as he goes to infinity, like that, a separator. Is there going to be, are there going to be more separatrices? Yes, this is a saddle point. There's got to be an unstable separatrix, too. What I've drawn here is really a stable separatrix. Solutions are approaching that point along these curves. As t goes to infinity, there have to be solutions that go directly away from those points as t increases as well. In fact, in approach the points as t goes to minus infinity, unstable separatrix. And if you think about it, it's got to look something like this. Because if it went into here, it would be going the wrong direction. It can't go over in this direction either. It's got to go this way if it's going to go to the north at least. You're going to have an unstable separatrix about like this. You can draw in some other solution curves. You'd have solutions going like this down here, solutions like this, and like this. This is filling it out a bit more. That takes time, okay? And it takes practice. And nobody's perfect, including me, all right? We're looking for reasonably good pictures. Your example, again, is going to be somewhat similar to this. I probably won't draw the null clines for you, but I probably will, will say what with the cubic one, and there probably will be a cubic one, where its roots will be and maybe where its max and minimum will be to help you sketch it in there. I haven't used linearization. You should be able to do that, and in fact, if we do use linearization, it's possible there's other bifurcation values. Is it a guarantee? No. Calculate the Jacobian matrix question. Good question. Yeah. How did you determine the directions of the solutions? How did By you thinking about the signs of dx dt and dy dt when I was over here and I was talking about when is this positive? X plus y is positive when y is greater than negative x. You're above this slanted line when y is greater than negative x. So that's telling you when dy dt is positive, solutions are going upwards when you're above that line and downwards when you're below that line. And then the x dt is positive when y is greater than this when you are above the cubic curve. And it's negative when y is less than this, below the cubic curve. So you move to the right when you're above the cubic curve and to the left when you're below the cubic curve. So it's tricky. I would, as practice, I would suggest redoing this problem on your own without looking at notes if you're taking notes. What about the local linearization here? What's the Jacobian matrix? Um, differentiate, first of all, dx dt with respect to x. Let's focus on the case where a is negative. Well, let's focus on the general case, actually. For general a, you'll get uh, 3x squared plus a. Derivative with respect to y is 1. For the second right-hand side, derivative with respect to x is 1, and derivative with respect to y is 1. 
at the origin, which is always an equilibrium point, this reduces to A111. A111, yep. And the quickest way to try to classify that is to think about the trace and determinant. Trace is A plus 1. Determinant is A minus 1. Thinking of that as defining a parametric curve in the trace determinant plane, you can plot points to help you plot it. I hope you could also just think about it here. If you solve this equation for A in terms of T, you'll get A is T minus 1. And if down here you replace the A with T minus 1, you'll get D is T minus 2. What this is telling me is this parametric curve defined by these two equations here is along the line d equals t minus 2. It's got slope of 1 and d intercept of negative 2. It's a line that looks like this. It definitely crosses the t-axis, which is one of the critical loci. When d is 0, that's going to happen when a is 1, which you already know is a bifurcation value. Another confirmation of that. Those three equilibrium points are really merging together into one equilibrium point when A is 1. Is there another bifurcation value? Well, only if it crosses the repeated root parabola. For analysts, at least, which we are going to be. I'd probably tell you if it does to help you decide what it does, whether it does or not. Does it here or not? The key question is, is 4D ever equal to T squared? Because that's the equation of the repeated root parabola. Plug these things in. What does it mean in terms of a? 4d is 4a minus 4. t squared is a plus 1 quantity squared. Does this have any real solutions is the question. 4a minus 4 equals a squared plus 2a plus 1. a squared minus 2a plus 5 equals 0 would be the equation to try to solve. Is that right? I don't want to make a mistake here. What are the roots of that? The quadratic formula, 2 plus or minus square root of 4 minus 20. They're complex roots, which means there's no other value of A that's a bifurcation value for the origin, at least. You're never going to cross the repeated root parabola. There are no real solutions to this, if I have not made a mistake. Do look good people to people? Do you think I made a mistake anywhere? I got the same. Okay. What about the other equilibrium points? Could there be other bifurcation values for them? And actually, they're both going to behave the same. The Jacobian matrix is going to be the same for both because it's just the x-coordinate squared there. It doesn't matter if I do plus or minus. What's going to happen when you square those, the square root's going to go away, the plus or minus will go away. You'll get 3 times a minus 1 here, then plus a. Forget about that a. 1, 1, 1, 1, which simplifies to 4a minus 3 in the upper left corner. Boy, I'm just doing bad with my blackboard use today. 4a minus 3, 1, 1, 1. Trace is 4a minus 2. Determinant is 4a minus 3 minus 1, which is 4a minus 4. You only have to think about this when a is less than or equal to negative 1. In fact, just less than, just less than 1, I mean. Did I make a mistake? I did make a mistake, didn't I? 1 minus a, not a minus 1. Plus three, right there. Yeah. 
So the trace is really um, negative 2a plus 4. And the determinant is negative 2a plus 3 minus 1 is negative 2a plus 2. You only think about this for a less than 1, really. That's when you have these equilibrium points. When a equals 1, where are you at? I mean, I could do the case where a equals 1 as well. When a equals 1, we get negative 2 plus 4. It is positive 2. The trace is positive 2. And plug in 1 there, you can do get v equals 0. We're right there. When a is less than 1, imagining tracing out this curve backwards, like that. I put an arrow on it going this direction because that's the forward direction as A increases. Looks pretty similar. To, in fact, I think it is the same as that, that line there. It's the same line, but don't draw it below the d-axis because the points don't exist when A is positive. Excuse me, when A is bigger than 1. It's not going to cross the repeated root parabola, just like this one did. So there's no bif other bifurcation values. A is equals 1 is the only one. This takes a while. Again, like the Laplace transform problems, I think I probably need to give you some help. Again, one way to give you help is to probably specify the equations of the null kinds, kinds so you get those right. And again, maybe tell you the, the x-intercepts of the cubic curve and tell you the max and min so you can draw it reasonably well. Maybe I'd tell you the Jacobian matrix to help save you, save you some time. I'm trying to think about ways to save you some time. Because it's a big problem. I would have you draw the phase plane only at one value of A. And I'd probably tell you what value of A, just like I picked A equals negative 3 here. Takes practice. Don't, don't go into the exam without practicing this. Maybe you want to try even more examples. I also have those supplementary videos with more examples. Those, at least one or two of those would be good to watch. All right, let's come back to now uh, trapping regions. So what can I test you about with those? What might I test you about? One thing that comes to mind is thinking about example three that we went over in class on Monday, where we thought about it initially in terms of polar coordinates. I would, you would not have to transfer that to rectangular coordinates. I'd probably do that for you. Okay. I would encourage you to try to understand how I did the transformation into rectangular coordinates. I probably wouldn't give you this exact problem because we're already doing it here. What did I do with this on Monday? On the board, if you want to watch the video, if you don't remember, I verified that the dot product of an outward pointing normal vector with the vector field was negative along the boundary. Outward pointing normal vectors along the outer boundary point this way. <coughs> outward pointing normal vectors along the inner boundary point this way toward the origin. Took the dot product of those. If you go back and look at the video, I did it in terms of polar coordinates, actually, ultimately. And saw that you always got a negative answer. That meant the angle between the normal vectors, the outward pointing normal vectors, and the vector field was bigger than 90 degrees, which is what you can see here. This angle, there's a normal vector right here. The vector field right there is pointing inward like that. That angle is bigger than 90 degrees. The dot product is negative. That's confirming, ultimately, this is a transverse uh, Smooth transverse trapping region. The simplest kind you can have. 
Probably your exam problem related to this will be pretty similar. Um, how might I change it? Perhaps I'll just change these equations a little bit. In fact, and here's a, a broader point about these kinds of systems, that attracting, that, that periodic solution is attracting. It's sort of like if you wanted to call a periodic solution a sink, somehow that periodic solution in black here is a sink. Solutions are headed towards it. In fact, it can be proved that this, solu this periodic solution is hyperbolic in a broader sense of hyperbolic, we only talked about hyperbolicity for equilibrium points. But basically what that means here is that if you change the vector field a little bit, if you perturb it a little bit, give it a little kick, you'll still probably have a periodic solution. It may not be on the unit circle, it probably won't be, but it'll be close to being on the unit circle if you don't change the vector field very much. And also the fact that this trapping region is transverse, that <coughs> The dot product of the outward pointing normal vectors with the vector field is greater is negative, meaning the angle is greater than 90 degrees. That's going to also mean if I change the equations just a little bit, that it will stay a transverse trapping region. That's stable as well. <laughs> so probably I will just change these equations a little bit. And probably you can use the same kind of annulus, the ring shape, and prove it's a trapping region with outward pointing normal vectors. Again, the outward pointing normal vector on the outer curve. The formula can be written like that. In fact, you could write it as n of y equals y. That would be an outward pointing normal vector on the outer curve. And for the inner curve, just take the opposite of that. Negative y. Negative x, negative y. That would be an outward pointing normal vector along the inner circle, which means it's pointing into the inside of the annulus toward the origin. An outward pointing normal vector along this boundary is going to point toward the origin. Okay, so probably it's going to be the same kind of annulus, same kind of outward pointing normal vectors. I'm just going to change the equations a little bit. I've got to, it's my responsibility to make sure you can still do it, but don't change them too much that it becomes too hard to do. Daniel? Um, so there's only going to be one equilibrium point on that. Uh, can we verify it by saying that like it's a sink, but then if you start further out with the vectors, it becomes like, it seems like it's a sort. Oh no, it'll always, never mind. Yeah, that equilibrium point's a source. And this kind of example would have to be. Um, yes, that is part of the Poincaré Van Dixon theorem. I think what you're getting at there. You are in trying to use the Poincaré Van Dixon theorem. You need to verify that the system has no equilibrium points inside the trapping region. If you're going to use this form of the Poincaré Van Dixon theorem. So it is important that the origin was the only, only equilibrium point here. And that is true. Is it easy to verify with these equations? Maybe not so easy to verify. Maybe I'd have to t tell you to trust me that the origin is the only one. I do want to mention that this is kind of a phony application of the von Kure van Dixon theorem. It is more important to be able to apply it in more situations that are, you know, important in applications, for example. And so I would encourage you to think about this Van der Poel system a bit. There's a periodic solution for the Van der Poel system. The equations for the Van der Poel system are right there. Epsilon is a parameter that I can change and I get a different system. But in this case, no matter what epsilon is, I always get a periodic solution. The thing is, it would be hard to construct a trapping region for this. If you were going to try to construct a trapping region for this, that would be an annular shape. Basically, you'd be trying to approximate the solution itself. Now, maybe you could do it with, say, piecewise linear 
straight lines. You'd have to probably create a bunch of them. It would be it, it would be difficult to try to create a trapping region and prove it's a trapping region for this example. But that would be, if you could find such a trapping region, that would be a more significant application to the, of the punk rate dixon theorem to guarantee you've got a periodic solution in this Van der Paul system. And the Van der Paul system is related to applications. I think Van der Paul thought of it first in terms of electric circuits. That's why he came up with these equations first. What do X and Y represent? I'm not sure. Maybe something related to voltages and, and currents. So maybe in a certain kind of set up with a circuit, maybe you can set it up in such a way that the voltage and current oscillate periodically. And that's what you would be seeing with this periodic solution. It is interesting. As epsilon gets smaller, you still get a periodic solution. And again, I mentioned in the reading that in my research for my PhD, what I did was come up with conditions for proving the periodic solution existed without using the trapping region. That is a trapping region for small epsilon. However, it would be nice to not have to bother creating these slanted sides. It would be nice to guarantee that a periodic solution existed, maybe by creating a simpler region. Maybe with a completely horizontal line across the bottom. Maybe you still slant the sides, but you have horizontal lines across the bottom and the top of the outer boundary and across the bottom and the top of the inner boundary. If you do create such a region, it's no longer a trapping region, but I came up in my PhD research with conditions when you can still prove there's a periodic solution. Pretty relatively simple conditions compared to the way some of the research out there is. I came up with relatively simple conditions. I can also apply it to um, my ideas to higher dimensional problems. Um, that's where I was able to prove that there's a periodic solution <clears throat> looking like this in a higher dimensional problem, three-dimensional problem. Right? Here's the periodic solution down here, okay? Based on a much more complicated system of equations, okay? The right-hand side functions, there's three of them, and they're pretty complicated looking. You can see all these equations. It's kind of a mess. I, I wouldn't expect you to understand that, okay? It's just for your information. Dot this kind of stuff is out there. People do try to do this stuff. and In fact, I did it for my PhD research. In three dimensions, very interesting things can happen. You can get pretty wild behavior. This kind of solution is called a bursting solution, by the way. And by the way, the real life model it's related to is um, the electrical activity inside your pancreas. There are these cells called pancreatic beta cells that exhibit this kind of behavior in their voltages across their cell membranes uh, when the sugar concentration, I think, or even though it's the calcium ion concentration is high enough, which might be related to the sugar concentration in your bloodstream. You get this kind of behavior, and the idea is this kind of behavior is connect, connected with insulin production, which if you know anybody with diabetes, you know they have trouble with insulin production. Um, I do want you to also know a little bit about chaos, which I, I've only briefly touched on maybe about a month and a half ago. There's a couple main ways that chaotic behavior, which initially you can just think of as kind of crazy behavior, can come up with differential equations. One is when your system is autonomous, but higher than two-dimensional, three-dimensional or higher. Another way is when you have a nonlinear system, even in two dimensions, where you've got some external force. I'll focus on the three-dimensional example here in class A, and in class on Friday I'll focus on the 
nonlinear system. I'm going to come back to this Lorenz system with the Lorenz attractor. <clears throat> this was something that I encourage you to read about. I would encourage you to, to look through this code here. For example, the code right here finds the equilibrium points. And in general, there's three of them, though there is a bifurcation value at rho equals one. That would be when the square root is the square root of zero, you'd have a bifurcation value there. Rho equals one. What did I show you with this thing before, and what will I show you again right now? I can linearize and so forth. I'm going to use any solve to look at solutions of this. And it's kind of pretty. That thing right there is called the Lorentz attractor. It's an example of a strange attractor. It's illustrating chaotic behavior in a way that I'm going to try to make a little bit more precise in a minute. It looks kind of like butterfly wings, and it is related to something called the butterfly effect. You should know the basic idea of the butterfly effect. Let's say that for the final example. What's the basic idea? The basic idea is that, okay, we actually relate it to weather here. A butterfly flapping its wings in Mexico, say, can cause a tornado in Minnesota two weeks later. That's the basic idea of the butterfly effect. If the butterfly decides, no, I'm not going to take off, there's no tornado in Minnesota two weeks later. But if the butterfly decides to take off, then there is a tornado in Minnesota two weeks later. Tiny little changes, in fact, arbitrarily small little changes in initial conditions can have great long-term effects. That's the idea of the butterfly effect. Is it true? Has anybody ever experimented with a butterfly and seen whether it caused a tornado or not? No, nobody can do such a thing. Because the butterfly either takes off or it doesn't, and there's either a tornado in Minnesota two weeks later or not. And you can't go reproduce the same conditions again. Okay? So nobody can literally experimentally prove that that kind of butterfly effect. But the idea is with chaotic behavior, it's something called sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Even with these deterministic, deterministic models, no probability here. These equations are completely deterministic, meaning the initial conditions in their exact form completely determine the future. However, nobody can measure initial conditions exactly. And tiny little changes in those initial conditions, arbitrarily tiny, can have vastly different long-term effects in these equations. So the idea is, theoretically, it's possible. Theoretically, it's possible that the butterfly flapping its wings in Mexico causes a, two, a tornado in Minnesota two weeks later. It's theoretically possible. It's plausible even that it could happen, though I don't think anybody can experimentally prove it happens. How can you verify the tiny changes in initial conditions have great effect in this model here? We can do it by actually making changes to the initial conditions. What I've got here are two solutions, two approximations to solutions that start out really, really close together. The initial conditions are super close together. However, in the long term, the red and the blue eventually separate and have wildly different behavior. And you can change the initial condition here. And the same kind of thing still happens. By the way, another um, upshot of chaotic behavior is that you actually shouldn't even trust these graphs. These graphs are generated with numerical approximations and you solve. But then solve is not perfect. There are errors in it that can get compounded, especially in chaotic systems. So it's these broad kind of things that I want you to know about. Maybe I'll write something up about them. I'm just describing them verbally here to you right now. I want you to know these kind of broad themes. Give me two more minutes. 
What should you know about Laplace transforms? You should be able to solve, use Laplace transforms to solve a first order equation, section 6.1, with a, um, a right hand side function that's exponential. The simplest kind of example. You should be able to solve that kind of equation without help. By the way, again, the word force is in quotes here because it's not really a, a situation where the right hand side would represent a forcing because it was only a first order equation. You only have the velocity in the equation, not the acceleration. So it's force in quotes. Okay, a section 6.1 type of problem will be on the test and you should be able to completely solve it without help. How about a second order equation? Like this one we did the other day. Well, I will tell you that there will be one like this on the test, but I will give you help. Okay? Especially help with the partial fraction decomposition and the simplification of the rewriting of the decomposition, especially when you have to complete the square. So I'll tell you what those things are. But you will need to know all the properties of Laplace transforms and inverse Laplace transforms, especially the shifting on the t-axis property and the shifting on the s-axis property, which if you don't remember what I'm talking about, you're going to want to look them up. You'll have to know how to apply those things to finish the problem. In the Mathematica notebook that I'll put on Moodle, and by the way, I'm behind on that, I know. I've got to do that after class here. I'll put this on Moodle. I also have two more examples. This one, the right-hand side function for a second-order equation is discontinuous. That's a more realistic situation where you'd want to use a little positive transform. But it is a very hard example. But I would encourage you to read through it anyway. You've got to open up this section here to see it. Here's an example. It's got something called impulse forcing. This is something called the delta function, delta sub 1 function. And um, this is not really a function in the usual sense of the word. There's its formula, ha, 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 ha. You ever heard of the delta function? It's not really a function. It equals 0 if t is not a. It equals infinity if t equals a. Huh? This is an example involving something that models hitting something with a hammer. So it imparts a force in a really quick amount of time, you essentially model it as an infinite force in zero time. And it turns out that's a useful thing to do. You won't have to do this for the exam. It's in section 6.4, but I would encourage you to read it anyway, because it's actually simpler. Dealing with the delta function is actually simpler than dealing with the even step function, even though that's an infinity there, and so you would think it would be harder. It's not really a function in the usual sense. Okay? A mathematician would not say that's a function. So it's sort of a function with a joke, but it's got applications somehow. All right, see you on Friday.